Troy, Gordon, Mark, thank you so much for your commentary on where 5G is headed, why we should care about network slicing, and the importance of enabling the technology behind it. Great stuff. For our final deep dive session, we're going to dig a little bit deeper to answer some questions about the importance of network slicing and the return on investment. For example, why is network slicing needed? What are the dependencies and how is it monetized? What are key factors in full life cycle orchestration and automation that will drive success? Here to provide some answers, Kevin Wade, Senior Director and Product Marketing Team Leader at Blue Planet Siena. Tim Duerin, Senior Director, Solution Marketing at Infinera. And Renata Vienna da Silva, VP, Products at InfoVista. Let's jump in one last time. Okay, here we go. Kevin, Tim, Renata, thank you so much for joining us. Let's start off with some introductions here, if you'd be so kind. Uh, please share a little bit about yourself and your role within your organization. Let's go Kevin, then right to Tim and Renata. Sure. Thank you, Jeff, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, again, my name is Kevin Wade. I work for Sienna and specifically uh, a division of Sienna called Blue Planet, Blue Planet being uh, the automation software that, that complements the, the Sienna portfolio, but is a uh, uh, multi-vendor in scope. And I handle marketing responsibilities, uh, strategy and, and tactics for this entire Blue Planet portfolio. Hey everybody, Tim DeWaren from Infinera. Really glad to be with you here today. Um, I run the solutions marketing team at Infinera where we work on um, open optical networking, uh, disaggregated routing and intelligent software automation for uh, next generation networks and really glad to be here. Hello, I'm Renata Silva. I'm, I come from InfoVista and at InfoVista I'm responsible for the service assurance business. So that's what I do and really happy to be here today. All right, we're certainly happy to have all three of you here. Thank you so much again for sharing this time with us. Kevin, let's start with you. Why is slicing so important to mobile operators and other service providers? Sure, and that I really like that question, Jeff, and it, and it really is the key question. Uh, so the industry today is, uh, you know, very rapidly where we are with our customers today. They're very rapidly rolling out 5G. I mean, we hear that we all see and hear the commercials from all the local operators, um, and they're spending a lot of money, heavy investments in rolling out these networks. Where slicing really comes into the picture is it helps them monetize those investments. And specifically, uh, corp the, you know, 5G is not just the, the new handsets for, you know, what we would call the, the residential markets. You and I buying new 5G phones from, you know, from our uh, service provider. Slicing actually adds a new layer on top of that 5G infrastructure for all types of customers that enables the operators to offer new compelling and differentiated services and, and leveraging the, you know, not just the incredible performance, you know, bandwidth and latency capabilities of, um, of 5G, but also leveraging some of the uh, customizable services or slices that they can offer to uh, people like uh, large enterprises, you know, gaming companies, event, uh, uh, event venues, a whole range of differentiated new services that they can offer as important revenue sources, again, to, to help monetize those 5G investments. So that's why, in my, my view, this is such a, a critical technology for mobile operators and other what we call CSBs, communication services providers that are, that are building out these 5G networks. Absolutely. That's a great overview there. Thank you for that. So in your opinion, when do you think we will see slicing really being deployed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, another another good question and, and uh, top of mind for a lot of people. So I guess the first thing to say there is that, uh, you know, 5G is uh, already being deployed. I mean, the, the 5G uh, handsets and some of the, the basic uh, access network capabilities that are, you know, very important for 5G, of course. But it 5G isn't just access, right? It is inherently a multi-domain build-out for mobile operators. There is the 
the access component, what we call the RAM, that is a, a virtualized open uh, radio access network. Again, that's the access network. But there, there, it also slicing also extends across the the transport or underlay network. Uh, Tim and I both will talk a lot a lot about that today. I'm sure. Um, there's also a, a a core that is also becoming virtualized, and 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 later on we'll be adding this, you know, what we call the mech layer. And I think Renata's going to talk a lot about that today. Um, now it isn't so it is inherently a multi-domain infrastructure, and different aspects of that. The different or segments of that uh, that network will uh, support slicing at different rates. The you know the I would say the the open RAN is 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 going to take the longest to to mature and and open up uh, just because of some inertia challenges that are there. Um, uh, whereas the you know the the core is already virtualized and 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 other capabilities like MEC will will emerge. Where we are today, and where transport, uh, or ra rather, where slicing is available today, is on this transport infrastructure, which is the very foundation of the the entire network. So, um, to to answer your question, I would say true end end network slicing is probably a few years away, but transport network slicing, the, the, this underlay uh, infrastructure that is more or less end-to-end -end and comes all the way out to, to the access network is something that I think customers are looking forward to testing in the near term. Mm. Thanks, Kevin. You talked about infrastructure. Uh Oh, I, yeah, I just wanted to add to that, that that it's interesting to see not only, okay, in one hand, we have the technology evolution, which will come, as, as Kevin was referring, in about two years from now. Yes, that's when we'll see the peak of, of this happening in, at the operators. But the interesting thing is to see operators already embracing the concept. Um, and because 5G is not only about the technology, it's also about the new business that they are starting to embrace the new business and trying to already test those business models, even starting with LTE. That's what is interesting to see. And more and more, we'll see them evolving in, in, that, in that area as well. Absolutely. Uh, Tim, let's move to you now. Uh, you know, just talk about infrastructure a little bit here. Uh, what infrastructure will be utilized in 5G transport? What do you think are the top infrastructure technologies for implementing slicing? Um, so I'll, I'll pick up on a couple of themes of both Renata and uh, and Kevin as I um, articulate the answer there. And, um, you know, we're definitely on a 5G journey. And uh, we started with kind of this phase one deployment, um, which is getting faster speeds to the handset or to your smartphone, if you think about it. And now it's time to think about what other additional services we could layer on that and how we could bring that to life, um, which brings you full circle to, well, then what type of infrastructure, what type of, uh, of transport infrastructure would we use in order to, um, to implement that? And um, because the 5G network is um, virtualized and can be distributed in its functions, um, we really think you need a flexible toolbox approach to the, to the transport infrastructure. And that means things like um, intelligent and reconfigurable uh, optics. It means things like ethernet switching with time sensitive networking to support um, front hall um, delivery. Um, it also means things like um, disaggregated and, and flexible routing, and, and ultimately then intelligent software automation has to come to play to bring that layer zero through layer three transport infrastructure together and provide that um, um, edge of the network to the core um, connectivity. Um, if you then move forward to say, okay, so that's my transport infrastructure, now how am I going to implement uh, slicing in that transport infrastructure? Um, the reality is that we've used uh, VPN or virtual private networking technology in our uh, packet implementations for many years in 3G and 4G networks before even getting to, to 5G. Um, when you talk to service providers or you look at any of kind of the research data from the industry analysts, you'll really see VPN technology um, still at the fore or top of mind from a, how can I segment that traffic? How can I separate that traffic? How can I map it and treat it differently uh, from a slicing perspective to connect those functions together uh, from the edge of the radio um, all the way back uh, to the core? So VPN definitely top of mind and, and a big part of the answer to that slicing equation. 
Okay, let's get a little more specific now. Can you talk a little bit about how open and disaggregated initiatives like TIP DCSG impact network infrastructure and slicing? Uh, sure. So the telecom infra projects, um, disaggregated cell site gateway or, or DCSG project is really about um, at the kind of edge of the network where I have um, a cell site aggregating router, if you will, um, uh, connecting multiple um, cell sites or, or radio network pieces together so that I can then begin to transport that. Th that's where that's actually operating. Um, and the idea is to separate the underlying hardware from the network operating system software. And the reasons for that are so that I can have more choice about the hardware I'm supplying. So I can put um, the next generation of packet processing silicon into the network faster. And so I can have this consistent behavior along this mobile transport uh, path. Um, while that's focused at that edge of the network, the reality is that disaggregated um, uh, capability of hardware from network operating system software can apply to the whole um, of, the, of the transport um, IP routing domain. And, um, and indeed, um, that's what folks are, are, are looking at in many cases and, uh, and, and using. Yeah. It, it, I'm sorry. I, I'm the, stay. Yeah, the one other oh, comment yeah. I just wanted oh. to add to that was... Um, it doesn't fundamentally affect the fact that VPN technology is still um, a preferred um, a choice for doing the implementation or the instantiation of the slicing for that transport. Um, we've changed the hardware software separation, but the VPN functionality remains the same. Sorry, I meant to add that to the end. Got it. No worries. Thank you for clarifying. Um, I'm going to stay with you here, or Tim. Do point-to-multi-point -point coherent optics have a role to play here in 5G transport and slicing? So if you take a look at, again, that kind of layer zero through layer three um, transport um, infrastructure, while we have the VPN technology operating at the packet layer, underlying that is an optical transmission capability. So um, optical transmission is certainly a part of that transport infrastructure. And um, if, again, if you looked at the primary research, you'll see cases where people say they want a, a, a harder slice or they want a, even more traffic separation at the optical domain. And so they might do things like assign a wavelength to a given slice of, of traffic for a given purpose. Um, so here's a wavelength for a slice, another wavelength, et cetera. Multipoint optics use subcarrier technology. And that same idea of being able to assign um, a wavelength can be applied to multipoint optics. And instead of assigning a wavelength to a slice, I can assign a subcarrier. One other benefit from multipoint optics is that because of the dynamicism of the um, virtualized and distributed nature of the 5G radio access and, and core network, We'd like to have our optical network also be a little more flexible, assignable, reconfigurable. And the fact that I can move those subcarriers around uh, also gives me some added flexibility that is uh, potentially beneficial from a, uh, from a, a transport and a, and a slicing implementation at the optical layer. Great. A lot of great yeah, info there. Thank, thank you, Tim. Yeah, I, Kevin. Yeah, I would just echo that point, and that's an important one that, that Tim made. And I would actually even throw the word in there, Tim, of programmable, yep. right? You know, and uh, you know, uh, great uh, comment. You talk about two different types of slicing: hard slicing, which it is this optical layer, uh, trans optical transmission layer slicing, um, obviously very high capacity. And then on top of that, another type of VPN is more the uh, what we call the soft slicing. That's the IP layer. Uh, you know, virtualized uh, connection. Both are categorized as transport, but both of those types of slices have fundamentally different types of capabilities. Uh, but what makes them similar is they have to be dynamic, be dynamically configurable or instantiated. So uh, that's where automation, of course, comes into play. Uh, and, uh, and the openness comes into play, because that's one thing about 5G, fundamentally different from some of the previous generation technologies is that it's inherently open, uh, which makes disaggregation possible that, that Tim also discussed. So great, great points from Tim. 
Thanks, Kevin. Tim, you're not off the hot seat yet. I'm coming back to you here for one <laughs> last question. What do you see as the next steps in software automation for implementing slicing? Yeah, in in as I think about it, um, it really, I see kind of two key things. Um, one of which is when you think about a network slice, you know, you've got this physical network, and now you want to separate uh, behaviors and have an intent for that for that behavior. So, as an intent, maybe I want really low latency, um, you know, behavior in the network for this particular um, set of traffic. And so translating kind of this slicing intent into transport infrastructure per performance parameters and then, you know, distilling and assigning that is kind of one kind of next step that is happening. And you need to do it automated and consistent, uh, just like Kevin uh, was saying is, is a critical piece. And then the, the second piece, I think, that moves kind of out of the transport infrastructure into the broader question and in the broader context is um, uh, 5G isn't just the transport network. It's the radio access network. It's the core. It's those distributed functions. Um, it's the addition of edge computing. Um, an end-to-end -end slice has to take all of those things into consideration and all of those resources to map. And so that integration of kind of the radio network and the core, mobile core with the transport is, is the other kind of big next step in my mind about where we need to go to make this real from end to end. Yeah, another. If I can just, if I can, if I can just add to that. Yeah, please, um, Renata. Yeah, another trend we see is the the overall SLA. That okay, Tim was referring to the the end to end. Okay, associated to slices, there will be SLAs that will have to be met, and uh, assuring those SLAs at scale will require a lot of automation. So um, this will be probably not the next step, but one of the steps that definitely operators will be also looking at, since they uh, doing a manual, having a manual approach to to handle uh, that piece of of the of the job will not be straightforward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I absolutely, has to be automated and open. It's not not sustainable with the, the you know the, the approach today exactly. which is very manual in nature and 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 also agree with what you're saying too Renata assurance is a critical part of that that uh life cycle of a slice you know it need automation needs to apply you know in the in the design phase of slicing the the activation or orchestration phase and then assurance is that critical check at the end to make sure that the SLA is is met and and if need be modify the slice, you know, exactly. in, in a dynamic way so that it, it meets the intent that, that Tim was talking about. And that, that intent is, you know, really a policy that drives everything about the way the service is, is managed exactly, from a lifecycle exactly. perspective. Yeah. And networks, to your point, yeah. Kevin, network, networks change, right? So, you know, maybe I have it today and I've service assured, but ongoing performance monitoring, ongoing um, behavior sanity checking, right? As as we're living through the life cycle mm -hmm. of this thing is gonna be a part of it as well. Yeah. And that's the magic of slicing really. And and why it is so, uh, you know, I guess interesting uh, to, to operators that fundamentally different from any, you know, if they, if you wanted to provide guaranteed bandwidth for a, a private enterprise before, you would have to build an overlay dedicated network, where, whereas slicing gives them this capability to, to deliver that dynamically and something customized just for that customer, just for that application, whatever it may be. That's like the magic of, of slicing in a way. Mm. All right, Renata, we're, we're coming to you now. Uh, Tim, you're officially off the hot seat, okay? <laughs> Thank you awesome. for all that. Grab a drink of water if you like. We're staying hydrated today. Uh, Renata, okay, coming to you now. So let's talk about the operational challenges for CSPs in managing the MEC domain in the 5G ecosystem. Yeah, so that will be uh, very interesting to see how this will evolve. Um, the MEC domain is actually a new domain. It didn't exist. Uh, so we talk classically about radio core transport. Now there's a whole new thing coming um, called the MEC. And, and this is where we expect the applications to be uh, deployed, uh, especially if they, need to, they are, if they are critical and need to, to have low latencies. 
So um, operators will basically, in terms of challenges and things they will have to handle, um, first of all, they need uh, to create, because this will be associated to applications, they need to create that ecosystem around application uh, deployment, application development even, that will help actually application providers to uh, innovate and deliver some services, new services connected to 5G. Um, the second thing that uh, I believe will be quite key uh, is to handle that domain as such, right? So there will be uh, the needs of handling the, the application lifecycle. So deploying the, the applications, updating them, uh, assuring them, uh, assuring that the quality uh, is, um, is in place all the time. Um, and in order to do that, they will need the DevOps processes to be in place uh, and uh, connected as well to the slice life cycle because they, that domain cannot be seen in isolation. Many times these applications will be connected to the slices that are running end to end in the network. Um, and, and having said that, the, 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 once the, since they are not in isolation, once running, uh, operators need to consider not only, of course, the performance of the application, but seeing the slice in an end-to-end -end way where and connected to the SLAs. So to me, the challenge will be, um, for instance, whenever there's an SLA degradation, to isolate the problem. Is it coming from the MAC domain? Is it coming from radio, transport, core? Where is it from? Uh, so this holistic perspective on the, the whole slice, including now the, the, the new uh, mobile edge computing domain, it's very important. Um, and then from um, more a business perspective, I think operators also need to consider uh, that this is connected to a new business model. Right, so they will need to uh, think about how to actually manage uh, the, the, that relationship with the application providers, since once they have their applications running in their network together with slices, they will be definitely willing to see um, the utilization level of the slices they have bought together with the performance uh, of the application they have running so that they can ensure that when they are uh, delivering their own services to their uh, consumers or business uh, 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 customers, then they are successful and have the right quality in place. So trust in the whole, um, let's say, environment that operators will create will be quite, quite important as well. Great. Great. Can you talk a little bit about the opportunities that exist for CSPs in the MAC space? Uh, yeah, so uh, the opportunities around, uh, from my perspective, in expanding the value proposition, right? Because the, uh, we talk about network as a service, as the, the, the key direction operators are taking and the, let's say, the new service offering there that can be in place uh, 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 powered by 5G slicing and the mobile edge computing capabilities. So if they, they can actually expand uh, their, their value proposition by introducing this new ecosystem uh, for application development, for, um, for let's say efficient management of applications so that it becomes actually frictionless, uh, frictionless for the application providers to, to adopt uh, these new services and de develop on that. The more, uh, I would say, uh, the bigger the ecosystem is and the more dynamic it is, uh, the better uh, for the operators, right? Because they will be creating business out of that. Uh, now, I think what will be the interesting, because I, I see this as a both a threat but also an opportunity, is how the dynamics will work with the cloud providers because that's a gray area, right? So the cloud is expected to run, uh, be run by the infrastructure providers like AWS, um, Google, Azure. So that those will be probably in, in, the, in the picture many times. So it will be interesting to see the go-to-market approaches operators will have. Um, because from an operator point of view, they will have the, the offering itself. So the network as a service comes from them, actually. Um, they own the connectivity. They know where is the best place to actually locate the application. But uh, then there's a whole, uh, let's say, installed base that uh, cloud providers already have 
that can be leveraged and if they do a good, uh, let's say, com and a combined uh, offering, uh, it will be, I think, maybe the most powerful combination that, that will take place. Um, another area is... It, it mm -hmm. Sorry. No, go ahead. Sir. I was just going to say, Renata, if you don't, um, it seems like that collaboration... I mean, at least at this point, you know, has to happen in, in some ways because the the service providers have the beachfront property, uh, right? They exactly. Have the, <laughs> they have exactly. the prime edge real estate while, the, while these guys over here have the, you know, we'll call it the distributed application know-how. Um, and so it just seems like that, that, that collaboration, at least for now, is, uh, I don't want to use the word inevitable, but, but going to happen. Yep. And uh, then it's how does it work out? How does it, you know, can everybody monetize and, 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 and benefit? Yeah, from it? exactly. Um, and I, I see, okay, uh, if we look at the operators, I think it, it's a totally new space for them. And having the skills uh, and the scale to handle all that uh, right. will become a bit overwhelming. So I think, yes, easier will be to partner and leverage on what exists and uh, ensure that, uh, well, the value proposition as a combined offer is, is the, okay, the, the, the optimal one. Um, and, and we can also see, for instance, the marketplaces that cloud providers are introducing and will probably expand as we also evolve in this area. How will operators leverage on that as well if they will, or if they will be creating their own marketplaces? So these dynamics will be quite interesting to see. Yeah, very exciting, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, it's and just, a, you know, uh, I guess provide a few additional thoughts. It's it's clearly th this dynamic between the cloud operators, you know, the the AWSs and Azures and Googles of the world, and the and the bigger CSPs and mobile operators is truly a coopetition. That's the word that gets thrown around a lot. But there there is a, a, a the dynamic will be figured out. It, it just it's it, it'll be interesting to see. You know, because what the battle is for is, I think, owning the end customer experience. Sure. Right? Who, owns who, who owns that 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 experience, so to speak? Um, but the really interesting thing to me is how this, how how Edge and five G have really spurred and accelerated the digital transformation. It's called on the CSP side for for years and years. It was it was nascent, right? But uh, but it really has kicked into high gear over the last year or so. In, in part because of right. the potential of slicing mech, but also for some other environmental factors, you know, that are that have been happening over the last year and a half, <laughs> uh, driving this digital transformation. Uh, but it uh, it'll be interesting to see how that dynamic dynamic works out. There's some big big players involved, um, and a lot of money involved, in investments involved. So uh, it, it'll end up being a win win for for everybody. I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is such a great conversation. I appreciate every everyone uh, adding insights. I mean, we have time for just one last topic. Kevin, why don't you bring us home here? What are some of the most important network slicing standards? Yeah, and and again, I'd, it'd be great to hear from from uh, from others here uh, on this topic. And uh, it, that is another good question. And and the word there is most important. Um, so I would have to say, in the terms of most, the most important is clearly the. The, the GSMA, I'm sorry, 3GPP, excuse me, slicing standards, because they're defining the slice, slice lifecycle management uh, hierarchy, if, if you will. You know, how, how you manage a slice at the, you know, in the, at the automation layer, end-to-end -end layer, and at the domain layers, right? Because there are multiple domains, as, as, we, as we've all mentioned. Um, but underneath that, you know, there are a host of other standards that are involved, and I'm I'm going to have to review my notes here. Another critical one is the ORAN Alliance. They're they're really working directly with the the mobile operators themselves, and every big one is a member of this ORAN Alliance to define how and, and ex accelerate the opening up of the RAN. Which again, there's some inertia there that needs to be overcome, uh, but it's it's it, it the, the operators themselves are very much driving that, and then. In the back office, the in the operations, so to speak, uh, and Renato was talking about that extensively. The TM Forum Open APIs and open and standards are really important there because it, it's essentially those are important to how you operationalize and 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 bill for these slice based services, and then and then the others are all related that I would cite or related to to network initiatives. And there's Etsy, NFV. 
that you know moving to containerized base or cloud native services there's me, the mech standards are under etsy and then and then tim talked about about tip and both tip and onf uh and, and other uh, organizations sdos as we call them are defined and i of course i got to mention mef right mef there with the life cycle service orchestration uh uh standards as well kind of applies to the whole hi hierarchy east uh, north south east west so there's a host of standards involved i i, I think that's a really a short list i don't know tim and, and renata are there others you know that are hey, you, that are you covered the gamut yeah there, i agree and, i agree uh, <laughs> it, uh, okay. the, the only i was gonna i was gonna yeah. add mef because uh but you did it you good job <laughs> Uh, certainly a <laughs> collaborator there. The other is I would just, the only one I didn't hear was maybe IETF, which uh, the Internet Engineering Task Force is always, anytime there's anything IP involved, uh, they're usually playing a role and certainly yeah. they're they're hanging around here as well uh, and have some yeah. work groups and, and other things. And uh, otherwise, that's a pretty comprehensive list uh, from, from my perspective. Yeah, thank you. And that can figure right is critical. And what's, again, what I think is is important to note here is that there's even a spirit of openness that extends across all this SDOs as well. They're all working together and the MEF is probably the best at this. They, they liaise, it's called, you know, nice French word. They liaise and they make sure all their standards don't overlap. And, and, and they are fo fo focusing on their specific domain. That wasn't the case three, four years ago when there were multiple overlapping standards that only added to the confusion. Now, in fact, fo again, driven by folks like the MEF, everybody's focusing on their specific areas, but making sure they work well with these other not competing so and not specific. reinventing the wheel either, right? Because we, we really is an right, efficient exactly. ecosystem. Right. You know, let's not let's uh -huh. not replicate the same activity five times. Uh, let's try to choose a best of breed and move forward. Yeah, very good. Exactly. Yeah, I couldn't couldn't have wrapped this better myself. You three are making this easy for me. That's uh, that's gonna do it. Thank you so much for your time and your insights. We really appreciate it, Tim, Kevin, Renata. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff.